Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4. Bella, thank you so much for the song. And I think it's featured along with, with that song. And thing with the message. Exodus chapter 4. And uh, verse, from verse number 1, 1 through 5. Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me nor hearken unto my voice. For they, that's Israel, that's God's people who's been begging God for deliverance. You know the story God is about to send Moses to get his people out of bondage that they've prayed for for so long. And Moses is saying to God, they will not believe me nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, the Lord have not appeared unto thee. And the Lord, like he would do to every one of us, said unto him, Moses, what is that in thine hand? And he said, a rod. And he, God, said, cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground and became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. You would say lack of faith. I wonder what you would have done. I don't like snakes. It's my enemy. I have nothing to do with snakes. So Moses ran. And the Lord said unto Moses, <laughs> You run, Moses, but put forth thine, thine hand and take it by the tail. God, help us the things that God would ask us to do. And he put forth his hand, caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. And here's why God did that. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob had appeared unto thee. Our Father, thank you so much for tonight. and We thank you for staying in the storm, the physical storm. And God, even the storms in our own lives, as we trust you in difficult times, we think of Pastor Foster and his wife, and flu. And God, we pray you touch them for your glory. Thank you for their faithfulness over the years. And God, for him to be away from church, it has to be something special. But you're the God who made the body. I pray that your will be done in his life. And God, we commit this service into your hand. I pray that you'd speak to us. I need help tonight. I need to be drawn close to you. Use me as your mouthpiece. Save the lost. Revive the saints. Encourage your people from your word. By your spirit. Bind the works of darkness. God, tonight we pray that you would cleanse, wash, and purge. And cleanse one righteousness. righteousness. We trust you tonight the preaching of your word that you and you alone will be seen and exalted. We ask in Christ and for his sake. Amen. God is about now in our text to send Moses seemingly with man on mission impossible. God is calling Moses to be the deliverer of Israel. Understand the context. Moses is now about eight years 
it's zero. Our context, we say that's an old man. It's not just 80 years of old. But Moses is a fugitive from Egypt in Exodus chapter 2, 11 through 15. Moses is running for his life. Moses has found refuge with Jethro, now his father-in-law. Moses has gotten a wife, but Moses has gotten a job. That's to keep charge of the flock. It does not appear, Moses does not appear to be the right candidate to send as a deliverer to take God's people out of bondage, out of the iron fist of Pharaoh. Moses gave every excuse as to why God made a mistake in asking him to go and bring his people out of bondage. Brother said tonight, we need workers. In Moses' sight, God does not know what he's about in calling him. I want you to note the context. Moses says in chapter 3, 11 through 12, that he is not worthy. He's not worthy. And I'm, I'm contemplating on that a while. And Moses have good reason to say, Lord, I'm not worthy because... A few years earlier, Moses now run from his life with death. Moses a murderer. Moses killed in trying to rescue a nation. One preacher said he ran ahead of God. So God is saying to the murderer, I'm turning you around and sending you back to where you wanted. To deliver my people. You would think that this excuse is valid, wouldn't you? For a job to stand before Pharaoh and say, Pharaoh, let my people go when you murdered an Egyptian. So in man's eyes, that should be a valid excuse. But in God's eyes, it's not valid. Amen. We will see God can change things around in an instant. Amen. So Moses is saying, Lord, I'm a murderer, I'm a killer. I'm not worthy to be called. Me, of all people, I'm a nobody. Added to that, again, I'm a murderer. I know my past. Don't you know your past? Don't all of us have a past? Of things we have done that you're ashamed about? Moses say, number one, Lord, I don't feel worthy. Number two, <laughs> he gets another good excuse. He says, Lord, they'll ask me, what's your name? I don't know your name. Who are you? When they ask me, who is it that sent me, what would I tell them, Lord? Yeah. I don't know your name. I really don't know you as I should. I've heard about you in time past. Really? What's your name? What's your name, Lord? 
in chapter 3, 13 and 14. What's your name? God says, I am that I am. <laughs> That's excuse number two. But Moses is going from one point, and, and I, don't, I don't know about you, but that is typical, maybe not you, but me. God is, God is asking to do an awesome thing in the Caribbean, and, and I, I, I've, I'm giving excuses, why not? And I'm still giving excuses. So maybe it's not you, but it's me. But he says, I don't know your name, but then he's saying something else. He says in chapter 4, 1 through 9, he says the people will not believe me. Lord, <laughs> all of a sudden I'm appearing to them, I'm saying I'm your deliverer. They won't believe me. Pharaoh won't believe me. I have no credibility. I can't stand on my own. Lord, they will not believe me. Have you said that? <laughs> In chapter 4, 10 through 12, or 10 to 15, Moses gives another excuse. He says, Lord, I can't speak well. I have a speech problem. Lord, there are better people who, can, who are eloquent in speaking. Choose other people, but Lord, I have a problem in my speech. So you definitely made a mistake. It's not me. Do you have problems speaking? Are you bold? Are you shy? I was one shy guy. And believe you me, I still am. I like to stay in the background. I like nobody to know much. Lord, I can't talk well. Maybe I don't have good education. Maybe there are people who can put the words together. I remember the day after I got saved and I started going to church. And nothing wrong with it, but they would call on people to pray. And I was in a group of men praying, group of us praying and and then sometimes they'll be called to pray up in, up in the open. And these guys know how to rhyme their words. How about you? I mean, these guys were so good at putting the words together. And good night. And I said, that's praying. I can't pray. I, I hear some people preach and good night. Lord, I'm not eloquent. Not eloquent. Not good with words. In chapter 4, 13 through 17, he says something else. He came to the crunch of the matter. He said, Lord, send somebody else. Now, you, you, Lord, you, you, you don't believe me when I said I'm, I don't feel worthy. You still ask me to go. And don't I tell you, I don't know the name. What name should I tell them? You still at me, Lord. I said to you, Lord, they will not believe me, but you still not giving up. Lord, I, I told you I'm not good with words. But you still trying to get at me, Lord. Send somebody else. I'm not your man. I'm not your woman. I'm not that lady. Lord, you really don't know my past. You don't know I'm ashamed to speak. You don't know I'm not that educated. You don't know things about me. Have, have, you, have you gotten a conversation with God? Have you? Gotten a conversation said, Lord, God is asking you to do something for him. And he said, Lord, 
you, you, you're definitely making a mistake. I want you to watch this. In the middle of this account, God asked Moses a question. That's what we want to deal with tonight. Look at verse number two. The Lord said unto him, What is that in thy hand? <laughs> Moses, what do you hold in your hand? Moses said, A rod, a piece of stick. A piece of dry, dead stick. That's all. In Moses' eyes, that's all that is. Just a stick. So I want to turn that around that God asked me and is keep asking me. Samuel, what do you hold in your hand? Sister, what do you have in your hand? What is that in your hand? What are we holding in our hand that is preventing us from surrendering all at the altar? Like Isaac. You see, and you will see throughout the discourse, Moses, God wanted him. The two things, principles I can find here Moses held his personality in his hand. When Moses said, A rod, he was referring to his shepherd's staff. That was a stick. And most people would say it's about six feet long. And that, that shepherd's staff or stick was used in a variety of ways by the shepherd. It was used to guide, to lead, and to protect the sheep. It was used to support the shepherd and help him as he climbed up down the steep mountain places. To look for a shelter and a place for his flock. That shepherd rod was used to defend the flock and the shepherd against the attacks of wild animals. And others would threaten the flock. I want to get at. I'm, I'm slow. But from what I'm getting, Moses depended on that piece of stick. Yet the full value of that piece of dry stick was not evident to him. You know, you and I can depend on some things, but the full value of why God gave that thing to us, we don't know. What is in your hand? A rod? A job? I will come to that. What's in your hand? Education. What's in your hand? Your future? What is in your hand? What are you holding in your hand? What is that in your hand? What is it? That you're depending so much on it. But yet don't recognize what you hold in your hand. Brother, something I see that that rod identified Moses as a shepherd. When people saw Moses with the rod in his hand, they knew immediately who he was. He was a shepherd. That rod represented all Moses possessed. But I want to see something here. 
Emmanuel, watch this. While Moses was taking care of the flock, the flock did not belong to him. That flock belonged to Jethro, his father-in-law. So he was taking care of a flock that was not his. All he possessed was that piece of stick. That's all he had. That's all he had. That piece of stick Moses had reminded him of his past life. Because once they saw him, they knew he was a shepherd. But Moses was not always a shepherd before. Moses was saved out of the river, placed into the palace, and was trained to become the next king. Do we get that? Moses had servants taking care of him. Everything you'd ever want is in the palace. And so, here is Moses now with a rod in his hand. And I'll say to somebody, I believe sometimes Moses had conversation with that rod. Maybe the rod saying, look at you. You are failure. Look what you're holding. Look, look what you're looking at. The backside of the desert when you had people washing your feet. You now reduce to smelling the animal waste. You just a common servant. And what you're taking care of does not even belong to you. It belongs to somebody else. Look at you. Think of your life. You are a failure, Moses. That rod must be constantly reminding him of that. You are a failure. Every morning he got up, got that rod. So you understand when God says, what is in your hand? A rod. It's conscience. Again, I want to ask, what do we hold in our hand? What do we have in our hand? What is it? You consider yourself to be a failure? You are exactly where God wants you to be. You are the exact place where God wants to turn your life around for his glory. Man may count you a failure, but God never. Romans 8, 28. All things do work together for good. The good, the bad, the ugly. Sometimes we have no answers for why things happen in our lives. It's not the eyes that God wants. But it's us. So we hold our personality in our hands. That's who we are. That's what people see. Ha. Moses, what's in your hand? Keeping the sheep of somebody else? Like Moses, we have some things in our hands. Let me itemize some quickly. Maybe not you, but in my life, this preacher's life, sometimes some past sins hell in my hands by failures 
and the devil brings all my past failures. Uh, Brother Leonard Fletcher, wonderful preacher friend of mine in Mountain City, Tennessee, sang a song about that. The devil brings up your past. He tells you of all what you've done. And sometimes we hold the past failures in our hands. Moses, go back to Egypt. I'm not worthy, Lord. Don't you know what I've done in Egypt? Messed up. So because I've messed up, Lord, you've made a bad choice. And we can go a little in depth, but you get it. Paul said, forgetting the things that are behind. John says it this way. John says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us some of our sins. Hello, are we here tonight? John says he's faithful and just. He's faithful. He's faithful. He's faithful. God is faithful. But not just that alone. God is just. And who is that justifier? Man can't justify me. God justifier. So John says he's faithful and just to forgive us some of our sins. The sins the brethren refuse to let go in your life. The sin that people think that God will never forgive you. God is faithful and just if we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us all. And to cleanse us from all. So what don't we get? All is all. But if you're like me, sometimes we are hunted by our past. And Moses was hunted by his past. I've heard many preachers talk about Moses, one of the best pastors you could ever have in the wilderness. Don't hold his past against him. Are we okay? Are we okay? Don't hold his past against him. So, so Moses and us sometimes hold our past in our hands. We hold our past in our hands. Not just that, but some of us hold had feelings in our hands. What people have done to us, we don't let go. And because they have hurt us, and because something has happened in our life, we don't want to let go, and we can't move forward. I was saying to the church in Alabama, This is a wicked world that we live in. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know what hurts you have in your life. I don't know. Let me rephrase it. I don't know what dead, dry stick you have in your hand. That's preventing you from surrendering at the altar. God is seeking you. You. God is seeking me. That's what he's looking for. He wants me. He wants you. Hurts. Hard feelings. <laughs> I preach on that. Unforgiveness. Uh, listen, one of the things that I have learned that keeps so many of us from serving God as we ought to is when we refuse to forgive somebody else. Refuse to let it go. 
And I don't have to stay there long. Unforgiveness. There's something else. Sorrows in our lives. What I found out now is that sometimes we have people in our lives and who are sick and we don't want them to go. We don't want God to take them. And God takes them home. And we got broken about that. We grieve over it. We get to a point where we get angry with God. We get angry. And that becomes a block. So we hold in sorrow of a lost loved one in our hand. We've had a few folks who are close to us who have gone home. I've learned this thing about death. The death of a Christian is planned by God. I want to say that again. The death of a Christian is planned by God. The Bible says precious in the sight yeah. is the death of his saints. Precious in his sight. And that gives the understanding that God plans it long in advance because he's sovereign. So we may pray for the person to get cured, but God knows best. Not just a matter of sorrow, of death, but sorrow of events in our lives. We don't have the time to go over all that, but there are times things happen in our lives that bring sorrow to our heart. And sorrow leads us to depression. And prevent us from going forward for God's glory. It becomes a dead piece of stick. God says, Moses, what do you have in your hand? What is it, Moses? What do you have in your hand? What are you holding on to? The feeling of inadequacy. Building negative feelings. And I've, I've talked about inadequacy already. Moses, I'm not worthy. Negative feelings. About the calling of God. About God using us to do something. I hate something else. Brother, it's obvious that God has given you a talent. It's obvious. God has given you a talent to sing. To play and sing, sister. Sister, foster, to sing. And, and there are other people that God have. Listen, I, I try to sing and I make a joyful noise unto God and, and things of that sort. And I'll not stop singing and all that stuff. But I mean, I, I can sit down and listen to some people sing. God have just gifted them. Amen. God have given some people to give. All of us need to give. But there are some people who are just gifted in giving. And you just name it. The talents that we have, the education that we have, becomes a dead piece of stick in our hands. Because we want to do it. It's us. What do you have on your hand, Moses? A stick. A rod. A rod. It's nothing, Lord. It's, 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 it's a nothing. My accomplishments. Thank God for what God has used me to do in the past. But there are so many more giants to slay. There is so much work, Emmanuel, still to be done for the honor and glory of God. Don't be satisfied and sit on our blessed assurance and just believe we've achieved, we've arrived. Hey, young lady, never be satisfied with the least. The sky is the limit. Don't just stay one place. Don't look back on your accomplishment. Wow, boy, look at what I have. Really, if it is you who have done it, you have done it. Think of Moses. He's now at a little rest at the backside of the desert. He becomes comfortable in the job of keeping the flock. He's 80 years old. And God says, I have some more for you to do. 
And he says, God, you're making a mistake. <laughs> Think of what happened in our life. I mean, this is a wonderful place. I'm telling you, this is a wonderful church. Hey, man, come on, talk to me. This is a wonderful church. You've got a wonderful pastor. God is working. But I'm telling you, the burden and the vision of pastor is greater. Are we okay? But pastor, we've accomplished so much. Who is your God? Come on. There's so much more to do for God. The world is yet to see what God can do for man, what God can do for church. It was fully given to him. Let's conquer. Let's go forth. The abilities, the talents that we have, our past problems, grudges. You know, if you see the picture of a shepherd, he has that staff. And I'm told most, a lot of times, he's leaning on the staff. You seen that picture? Let me ask a question. Are you leaning on that dry stick? Whatever it is in our lives, are we leaning upon it? Lord, I'm too old. But I'll be 63. In September. And I'm never more excited about what God can do in the Caribbean. I've got a terrible back problem. I walk on a side. Are we okay? Got a pacemaker in. You tell me, slow down, slow down, slow down, Samuel, slow down. <laughs> Folks on Ambassador Baptist Church watching, you know, sometimes when, when I get excited and I begin to preach, um, somebody say, Look at my hand. Turn it down a little. Turn down the pacemaker. Bella, what a wonderful job you did tonight singing. For God's glory. Let's keep going, sis. I came in the church. You know who brought me the front mic? Bella. What's your excuse? What's your excuse? What excuse do you have? What are you, what are you leaning on? What? I need to quickly move on. There's a second part of that. It's his personality. But <laughs> Moses was also holding his potential in his hand. What is that in your hand, Moses? A rod, a dry piece of rod, dry piece of stick. Moses objected to everything God wanted him to do. So what God decided to do was bring Moses through a series of miracles. So that Moses would understand that it is not you, Moses, but it's God through you. Or using your abilities or non-abilities. First of all, God said to Moses, and the question that is relevant to us tonight in the Lord, verse 2, chapter 4, and the Lord said to Moses, what is that in thine hand? And he said, a rod. And God said, cast it on the ground. So it's not you anymore, Moses. You have no power to do anything to that dry piece of stick. You've cast it away from you. Then I take over. Hallelujah. Moses cast that piece of rod and that piece of stick, dead dry piece of stick, and all of a sudden it turned to a snake, a serpent. Calling horror. I'm told the professional snake handlers, they got to hold it by the tail. They tried to hold it by the head. God said to Moses, do something that's difficult. Hold it by the tail. Because if you try to hold, when you look at people holding snakes, they, they hold it how? 
so he doesn't strike back. God always takes us on a hard journey sometimes. Hold it by the tail. So your whole trust is not in the snake or your ability, but it's in the one who tells you, hold it by the tail. And as soon as, as soon as he held it by the tail, it instantly became back a rod. In his hand, it was a dry, dead stick. But when he cast it out, it became alive. And I'm thinking, good night. And what I hold in my hands is dead. It's dry. It's not alive. But when I surrender it to God, <laughs> it, it becomes alive. It becomes alive. It, it becomes alive. It becomes alive. That dead piece of stick became alive and, and, and literally confused the smooth sayers. They didn't know what happened because that one rod swallowed all the other rods. The power of God is greater. Listen, young guy, I don't know about you. I don't know what's in your life. But if you cast yourself at his feet, he will make you into somebody the world will marvel at. You see, the problem is not him. The problem is us. I doubt him. But he's still powerful. I sometimes think that he's not able. But he's always able. I need to run on. The point again whatever the rod, the tool, the weapon that he had in his life, it was dead, but when given to God, he became a powerful tool. Let me just give you some things that that piece of stick did. Again, in chapter 7 and verse 12, it, it confused the Egyptian smooth sayers. They were confused. In chapter 7, 17 through 20, it was used to turn the waters of Egypt to blood. Point that rod, Moses, over the waters. <laughs> In chapter 8 and verse 5, it was used to bring forth the plagues of frogs. And you, you go on because of time uh, from the um, plague of lightning and thunder and lease and, and locusts and um, parting of the Red Sea in chapter 14, 16 to 21 and 22. It was used to cause the Red Sea when it was opened and the train of, and the train of Israel stretch forth your rod, Moses. That dead piece of dead dry stick, stretch it over the waters, and the waters spatter one side to the next, and the truth of Israel walked upon dry ground. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Dead piece of stick. And then when they were clear over, the enemy started coming through. <laughs> Moses said, those you see now, you won't see them by tomorrow. God said, Moses, stretch forth that rod again. Good night. I'm almost puzzled. Moses never again thought that this was a dry piece of stick. All the enemies were destroyed. You see the Ten Commandments and Pharaoh go back. Everyone that entered that water was dead. Dead dead. Animal, man, everything was taken over by the waters. What caused that? That dry piece of stick. It was used to bring forth water from a, from a rock in the desert, chapter 17, verse 5. It was used to bring victory over the Amalekites in chapter 17 and verse 9. Dry piece of stick became alive, became powerful in the hands of God. In the hands of God. God took the dry stick 
that weak, powerless, dry, dead stick. And in a mighty way, simply because Moses yielded that stick that was in his hand to God and for God's own and glory. So again, a question to Samuel Philbert. What are you holding in your hand? Your past sins? Your past failures? What do you have, Samuel Philbert? Your weaknesses? What do you have? Hmm? Your preaching? What do you have? What's your name, brother? Brother James, what do you have? Singing? What work do you do, Brother James? What work do you do? What is in your hand, Brother James? Your job? What's in your hand, sister? Your job? Nash, what's in your hand? Your job, young man? Making money? What's in your hand? What do you possess? The education? What is it? If you hear that to God, Nash, he will multiply that much more than you could ever think. Now, as you will to do things with what God has given you that man could ever imagine. Somebody thinks a lot about you, sister. A lot, a lot about you. You see potential. But sister, if you yield yourself to God, not holding back, it's amazing who you can influence. talking to you on Sunday. If you yield yourself to God and follow him, it's amazing what God can do in your life. But you see, you must go. I must be crucified. You see, if he is lifted up, John said it better this way. He said, I must decrease and he must increase. And so as I close, I ask you, what is that in your hand? What are you holding? One of the biggest hindrances in my life is pride. I don't have to ask for things for myself. And I have a good friend, but a dog, Hero. He tells me that all the time. I have to let go of me. But I spoke to Brother Foster. I'm sure he's watching. He said, you, you, you got to let go of what you knew and, and adjust if you're going to do the work for God. Listen, Manuel. Emmanuel Baptist Church. There's so many giants to be slain. There's so many victories to be won. There's so many things to do for God's honor and glory. Just yield yourself to Him. Like you sang, brother, it's not really Isaac God wanted. But it's us. And so I, I don't know what you have in mind, preacher. I'm closing, but could, could, could I have the brother sing that song again? As we close, and I, I just, I love this church. I, I believe God has amazing things that he wants to do in this church. But if you if would submit, if you would yield whatever you have in your hand, cast it at his feet. Cast it at the altar. Let go of it. Let God and see God take you, nobody, make you into somebody for his honor and glory. God help us. Stay safe. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.